grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Impossibilities. You know. Ecclesiastes, the preacher, is, uh, we had it in Crossways this last Wednesday evening, uh, along with the other wisdom literature. And reading Ecclesiastes is depressing. <laughs> so we know it more as uh, vanity, vanity, all as vanities. We don't know what vanities are today, except that those, you know, you, you have one over here and the woman sits there to put her face on and, and maybe you call it part of the bathroom fixtures and stuff like that. But it's uh, uh, a modern translation of it is worthless. All of it is worthless. And, and he talks about, and it's, it's somebody who loves wealth, loves his wealth, and says, what does it do for him? What does it do? You know, I just, I, if the more wealth you get, the more people there are seeking after it. You just ask any of these lottery winners. You know, often they said, you know, I, after, when I won the lottery, I got more phone calls from relatives I didn't even know I had. Right? And that's what it says. The more money you have, the more people coming after you to get it. Yeah. Government. Everybody else, you know, the more money you have, the more they want from you. And it's just, you know, so what, uh, you build it up, you try to work it, and it's just like, man, what a, what a struggle, what a headache. You know? And it does, you know, keeps you awake nights while you try to figure out, you know, how do you, should I buy this stock or sell this stock? Should I, you know, make this investment or not make this investment? Should I make this one and that one and grow, you know, keep your head swimming for, you know, I could get any rest at all, could get any rest at all. And, and what good does it do you? The preacher says, you came into this world naked, you're going out naked. Today we say something like, you know, it's, uh, they don't have trailer hitches on the back of hearses. Can't take it with you. Some people have trouble accepting that. A lot of people. Our beloved mother-in-law, you know, we told you about that a couple months before she died. She's sitting there with that pensive look on her face and says, what you think about, Mom? She says, I'm just trying to think how to take it all with me. Yeah, she didn't. Now the government's getting most of it. So, you know. Where it goes. What good's it? And, 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 and it, the, the preacher says in Ecclesiastes, so the father has a son, what can he give to him, you know? And what's it last? We've got there are people running around in Europe that have titles, which indicate that somewhere back in the family, they had a lot of money. But now they're less than common people. All they have is a title. That's it. All the family money is gone. The speaker of the Lutheran Hour this morning, the, the speaker emeritus, uh, great sermon when he talked about this, and he said that, do you know that, that almost everybody, at least in America, regardless of whether you're on the poverty level or not, are richer than Julius Caesar. You know, the emperor of Rome had had servants and all the you know, wealth and coming to everything and conquered and all that. And, and you have more, you know, because things like, uh, well, he goes through a whole lot of things. I'll give you an idea when he says, when it was summertime and Caesar was sweating. What do you do? We go turn up the air conditioning a little bit more, you know. All the kinds of things, you know, that he couldn't get, we could just go to the store. We get in our cars and ride in air-conditioning cars, and we get there, and we get richer than Julius Caesar. Was he happy with his? No. He was always wondering when Brutus was coming after him or somebody else. He was always wondering, you know, worry. Oh, what people, you know, it's... Wealth is one of the key factors, by the way, in the opening of that Old Testament lesson. When the writers of the Septuagint, the translators of the Old Testament into the New Testament, uh, our language of Greek, when they translate a little sometime before Jesus uh, was born, and they, they uh, translate the Hebrew into to Greek, 
That word, the rich man who loves his wealth, the word that they translated into Greek was agape love. Agape love was that special love of God for his people. That knows it all. But it's that kind of love that some people that have wealth have for their, that is the uppermost, the most important, regardless of anything else, that's what their life is all about. That's what that rich young ruler had as his problem. We talked about it last week at the lesson before today's gospel lesson. That he so loved, he could keep all the laws and regulations about taking care of our neighbors, not abusing them. But the first commandment, which is to have no other gods, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things, above everything. Put God not first in your life, but only in your life. He couldn't do that. That's why Jesus told him to go and sell everything and give it to the poor, because that was his weakness. That was his primary sin. That was his idol. He loved his possessions more than he loved following Jesus. And so he went away poorer than he even knew. The disciples couldn't fathom that. And then Jesus didn't compound their confusion when he says it's easier for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Which makes it, you know, still impossible. Uh, this eye of the needle thing, all about uh, five, six hundred years ago, uh, they come up with an idea to try to explain this. And uh, they created a, uh, the concept that there was a, a, a gate in uh, Jerusalem that was for when the caravans arrived or when a, a camel arrived at, at night and they'd, they'd already closed the city gates, that they would open up this particular little gate. It was, it was low. So that in order for them to get through, they had to take all the cargo off the camel's back, carry it in, and then lead the camel through on its knees. And so that, that was the eye of the needle, was saying it wasn't impossible. So you could just had to leave all your baggage behind, get down on your knees, and then you could get to God, kind of thing. You know. Well, that preached well, but archaeologists can't find any sign of such a, such a gate. Uh, they haven't come up with that. So. But it's even better to go with the, with the reality. You know, that needle, that eye, it ain't going to happen. We can't make it go any more than we, without faith, can move that mountain from over there to over there, that mustard seed. Faith. It's, it's impossible on our own. See, that's what was the problem with that rich young man. It was impossible for him because he loved his possessions more than he loved God. Our possessions. For some people, it's very important. It can be important to us too and still be God pleasing because those who love God more than they love their possessions can find a different attitude toward their possessions and a different way to live with them. When it's what we depend on, when it is our source of security and comfort, when we guide our lives and our investments on the basis of what we can determine is the most effective, then we're, if we do that without prayer and meditation, without recognizing that it all comes from God, if we are not like Job, remember that? Job, that Everything he lost, all his possessions, you know, all of his, his, his flocks and herds, all of his uh, uh, crops, all of his, you know, everything was gone. And then his ten children were all gathered in the tent of, of his eldest son, and a wind came, knocked the tent down, and killed all his kids. 
The only thing that Job had left was his life, his health, and his wife. And he lost his health, too. And yet he said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He rejoiced. Why? Because Job had what that rich young ruler didn't have. He had been given by God the joy in his heart to enjoy his riches. To enjoy them while he had them. Trusting in God that God can give and God can take away. It's God's choice. He can, he's God. I'm not God, he is. And he left it up to God. And recognize God gives, God takes away. It's God. God be praised. Can, could we do that? Eh, it's tough. It's tough. Immediately after the, all that happens, how can we praise God? But that's what God gives us. That's the blessings that God gives us. It's that, that joy in all things. That's why with that kind of joy, as Paul says, rejoice in all things. You know, rejoice. You know, bring up your joy in the face, not of just those things that are happy, but those things that are not pleasant. Rejoice in your challenges. Rejoice in your setbacks. Rejoice in the stock failure. You know, rejoice in all of those things. Because God is in control and he loves you and he has a plan and he can take those things which appear to us to be terribly disaster and make good come from them. I found an illustration of that this morning. Uh, Dave Seeger uh, read for this early service, he was the reader. And uh, so I was talking with him before the service and asked about his wife Pam. And he says, well she went to the doctor this week because she had, there was something wrong with her eye. Something, it was almost to the point of getting infected. And so she went to the doctor to find out, because it was just, you know, it's an annoyance. There was something, it couldn't get, went to the, all it was was an eyelash. It, you know, it had, it kind of in, grown long, grown in, and it was irritating. Irritating. So she went to the doctor, and, you know, done, fixed. While he was there, he took a look. There was something else wrong inside her eye. Something a little bit more critical. She didn't feel that yet. She didn't see that yet. But now, because of that terrible thing, and do you think that while that was going on, she said, oh, thank you, God, for this pain in my eye. I appreciate that. And, you know, love me some more. And uh, take care of me. And well, it's like the rest of us. Get rid of that thing, you know. What is wrong with this? But from that, it took her to the doctor. Otherwise, she wouldn't have found out about that other for a while until maybe too late to do something about it. It's an, we'll wait to hear the rest of the story. Okay. Doctor examines and takes a look at. But see, see God has, God's in, he, God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To put ourselves in, that's what the rich, rich ruler couldn't do. Rich young man couldn't do. And Jesus, you know, of course his disciples, he says, oh, God, we, Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. Like, okay, so what's the big reward we're going to get? You know, we've given up everything to follow you. Well, see, they missed the whole point. The point for the young man was that he couldn't do it. The disciples could do that. They had other challenges. <laughs> they had other challenges they couldn't deal with. But this, and Jesus says, you know, those who give up everything, their families, their possessions, for the sake of the gospel, will get hundred times that back. You know, more brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and households and all that than they can shake a stick at. Doesn't mean that they possess it. God still possesses it all. But you know, he's talking about the fellowship in Christ Jesus. Where God uses us to meet the needs of one another. We've got a lot of mothers. Thank you very much, God. 
we have a lot of fathers, a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, that sometimes act like mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, you know. But that's part of part of our fellowship together in Christ Jesus. And God puts us into fellowship so that we can take their care of things. But where's your heart? You know, it's hard to do that. In the Old Testament, it's interesting. God said, okay, I have given you everything. And to the people of Israel, he says, I have led you out of Egypt. Now, what I expect from you is a tithe of everything that you have, everything you receive. If you work for something, the tithe, the tithe was 10% of gross, not net. Tithe. And he said, and of the, the, your herbs in the garden, 10%. If you're a farmer, your grains, 10%. Of the best part of the crop. That's what God's directions for that. Do we do that? God, you're crazy. You see, in the New Testament, we don't have to do that. Hmm. But the Old Testament is a guide that we can do things like that. We can. And oh, by the way, we get into a fellowship so that together, as we put our tithes, oh, by the way, it was just tithes. Then there was also above the tithe was the offerings. The tithes were the percentage part. The offerings was more. The gifts, sin offer. All, uh, <laughs> and God established there are whole categories of types of offerings. Sin offerings, thank offerings, the, the, on and on and on and on kind of offerings. In the New Testament, you don't have to tithe. Now, there are some churches that do that. They demand that as a part of their membership. You got to tie. Here, you don't have to. We recommend it. It's a good discipline because it, it's a way of showing your trust to God that if you tithe, He'll take care of you with the rest of it. And it's kind of hard to start with a 10% cut off the top. So if you'd like to start tithing, start with a percentage, like one or five and then kind of set a time frame that you start with one percent and then if you find out you can do that then you go to two and then maybe five and then till you get up to ten percent and you say well I don't get much money well it's you know my income's kind of low right now well a percentage giving is on whatever you have coming in and you heard about the widow with the two mites that was all she had do you have to do that? No. No. But it's, it shows our demonstration what Jesus was saying to the rich man. What do you love? You think you need it? Don't you trust God to help you meet your needs? With the, who was it, J.C. Penney. Uh, he, had it, he had it really backwards. He tied 90 and kept 10. And that was more than he knew what to spend with anyway. So, but God, God takes care of us. And that's what, God not only gives us joy in our wealth for those who believe and love him first and only. But he, in, in Hebrews, it talks about how he gives rest. Ecclesiastes talks about it. When, when you love your money and you, you stay up nights worrying about it. Worrying about it. And so you get all that and you get no rest at all. You have to be cautious. You have to be careful. You have to be prudent. You have to plan it all out. And it takes a lot of effort. But for those who love God, they not only gives you joy in your possessions, but he also gives you rest. Gives you rest. Now, if I can fall asleep at the drop of a hat, I thought that there was. I thought that was because of fatigue or you know whatever kind of things. But I started looking back in, in my life, and it's not because I'm growing old. 
because I remember at age 40, that would be, I could still go to sleep. When I was a teenager working summer jobs, construction work, I had a reputation. Says the, the foreman would say, that hill, he's not afraid one bit of work. He can lie down right beside it, go to sleep. <laughs> Which is what I did on lunch break, get a half hour for lunch. It'd take me about five minutes to scrunch down my PBJ and uh, uh, whatever beverage I had. And then I'd get a 20, 25 minute nap in. Yeah. Up, ready to go. Because yeah, right. I wasn't worried about all that other stuff. You know, that's what I know now. I can go to sleep. When I have trouble, I need a little concentration. I'll take out my Greek book. I learned that in the seminary and start reading my Greek book. And I'm out about third word. So it's, you know. But God gives us not only joy, but gives us rest. His rest. That's why he established the Sabbath day, to rest. He gives that to us. Those who are worried about the world and are letting that worry take over their love for God have problems more than God wants them to have. We should fear, love, and trust in God above everything else but God. That's what it says. Fear, love, and trust in God. When we have that agape love in return to God for his agape love for us, that gave his only begotten son. That's what the, those last verses from Hebrews that, that we weren't printed on the bulletin, but we read. We had this great high priest who was the Lamb of God, whom God sent for us. So that Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have seen me, watch me, you see how my attitude is to God. What did I do? I, came, I take up my cross for you. So don't be afraid to take up a cross and follow him. He talked to his father. You can talk to him too. About everything. I got this, what's going on with my eye, God? What good are you going to make from this? Pam found out. <laughs> so when, when challenges come, expect, because God promises, he, for those who love God, he makes everything come out for your good, for good. He's working good for something, for somebody, for you, for others. You're his instrument. Love God, trust him above everything and anything else. And he will give you joy and he will give you rest. Not only rest here, but eternal rest with him in heaven. Where there's not any of the other challenges. There are no eyelashes that go weird. There are no other things that go strange and peculiar and wear out. There, we don't have to worry about the stock market, about retirement, about how you do all that kind of, It's heaven. <laughs> That's what I call it. Heaven. We can't even imagine how perfect and restful and peaceful and joyful and we know how that works. But that's ours. He has given to us through Christ Jesus. And he renews that in us through word and sacrament. He strengthens it to hold us to him. There's a lot else going out there to try to draw us away. But none of it is the truth except God. The triune God. Christ Jesus who died for you so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we struggle with that in the world, in time, because of sin. Till Jesus comes and takes us from here to be with him in the rest of eternity. That's the rest of the story. May Jesus hold you, comfort you, love you and help you to love him back so that you have his joy his rest and his peace